Please rise in body and or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Worship God with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. It is God that made us. We belong to God. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless God's name. For God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and God's faithfulness to all generations. Please remain standing and let us sing This Is My Song, number 340 in your hymnal. seated. Let us take time to confess our separation from God, first silently and then together as the body of believers. Let us pray. And let us pray together. Holy God, you come to us in our distress. When we feel alone and abandoned, you speak to us and provide companionship. When we feel scorned and betrayed, you assure us of your faithfulness. When we feel empty and aimless, you restore our connection to your abundance and nurture our souls. In our moments of crisis, you reassure us you are always near. 
Sometimes we don't recognize your companionship and assurance. Sometimes we don't share the good news of your love and hope with others. Forgive us. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. I'm not going to mess that up. Oh, sure. But that's a good thing. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, Psalm 123 is a petition by the community to God for divine mercy. Mercy is the theme. Let us listen to Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Here we go. Let's just stand here facing them because the first thing we do during the children's part of the service is wave to the crowd who is watching us on, te on television this morning, on YouTube or whatever, Facebook. So one of the cameras is way back there. Can you wave hi to all those people? And then there's another camera over there. Oh, over there first. Hi. Wave hi to that camera. And then wave hi to that camera. Oh, you it's not there. You can wave to, wave to Miss Sarah. 
this morning. Well, we're happy to have you here. Uh, something that you all might not know is that every Tuesday evening of this past year, there have been 45 Cub Scouts and one parent for each cub, plus all of the leaders, come every Tuesday night for Cub Scouts. Um, so maybe a third of again more than are here this morning come every Tuesday night. And for them, this is the church. This is what they think of our church is Whipple Hall and what they see on Thursday nights. Can you tell me what school you go to, Lydia? English Landing. And what is your school? Graydon. And what is your school? Graydon. Five of those cubs, two are not able to be with us this morning, uh, have met with Jack and me weekly for five weeks to earn a Jesus and Me badge that will be presented to them this morning. And it's been several weeks. What have you been doing since our badges ended? Tell me what you told me about in the narthex. Um, what happened in camp? We had to go to the storm shelter. Yeah, they were at camp and Camp Nash. And what happened? What time was it when you had to go to the storm shelter? Fortunately, I don't know if your parents knew at that time you were in a storm shelter, but that's one of those things that happen when we're outdoors, right? Right. Well, um, the five lessons we learned told about Jesus and uh, his role in our lives. What was Jesus like? And Jack is going to present the badges now to them and tell a little I'm lean against the pew here so I don't fall over. And I'm also follow some notes. I'm, my mental acuity is not what it used to be. Hope this doesn't mean I have to run for president. Uh, most of you know that the troop sponsors a Boy Scout troop that is over 95 years old. Literally thousands of, of young men and women in this area have gone through that troop either as members or uh, as parents or leaders or had a relative in them. Now, let me tell you how that works as a sponsorship of a troop. An or organization, and usually it's a church, they're the most popular sponsors, choose to sponsor a troop. As such, we are uh, provide a place for them to meet, assure that they are financially capable to doing so, and that they have adequate uh, and competent leadership. We partner with the Boy Scouts of America, which is soon to be, as you may have seen, Scouting USA, they're changing their name, and they provide a prepackaged program that is modified to suit our wishes and needs and they also provide training for leadership. Now, over the years, scouting has increased. You know, about 80 years ago, they added younger boys and uh, called Cub Scouts. Now they begin as early as kindergarten. And just in the past few years, we've added young ladies, women. And uh, so this church now actually has three units, a girl troop, a boy troop, and the Cub Scouts. And they're all, the last three numbers are 333. Okay. And 333 is well known throughout Clay and Platte County. Almost any person you meet who has any familiarity with Scouts at all, if they see 333, they know that means those are scouts from Parkfield Community or Presbyterian Church. Now, as part of scouting objectives, which are to build character, citizenship, and physical and, and moral 
fitness, the scouts also have an additional objective, and that is a duty to God. As a result, scouting has formed a partnership with an organization based in St. Louis called PRAY, P-R-A-Y Incorporated. PRAY stands for Programs of Religious Activities for Youth. And PRAY has developed with the virtually every religion known to man on all the churches and such a series of religious awards. The most common that you own, no doubt have heard of and many of you have probably earned is the God and Country Award that's given through the Boy Scouts. Through those uh, religious awards, young men and women get the opportunity to learn more about the religion and the churches that sponsor their units. So as Joyce says, during the last few months, we have met with five of these members of the Cub Pack, and they all were first graders, now they're second graders, and uh, they've been working on the God and Me Award, which is the first one that's available. As a part of those, they participated in many activities, they made some scrolls, but part of what they do, basically what they do is they learn about Jesus and them. In other words, Jesus and me. And through that, they learn that Jesus is the Son of God, that he has, is, uh, has served as a, a uh, Let's see, it was primarily his four areas, storyteller, teacher, friend, and healer. Now these young people here have completed their requirements for that, and it's fitting that since they have done that, you, you know, meeting in this church as their sponsor, that we present them the awards that they have earned here during a worship service. Now, in assisting with us has also been their parents, who are sitting up here in front, and uh, they are Tiger Cubs, which is the entry level uh, in Scouts, and, of Cub Scouts, and assisting them also has been their leader, Chris Mag, who's sitting here, and his daughter, who served as a youth leader, helping us in that also. And Chris, would you like to introduce these and present, to see that the parents present their awards? All right. Um, as a lot of you know, um, I am uh, the, the scout master for the Boy Scouts and uh, also a den leader for five great kids. Um, and like Jack had said, they had, uh, this is the first year that they offered the Jesus and Me uh, religious award. Um, so not only... They, they earn this uh, purple knot that they get to wear all the way through. Jack has one that he earned um, probably back in third grade when he was a youth. Um, so that will be one of the things that will carry, carry through uh, from the blue shirts to the tan shirts uh, uh, through on the life. Um, would your parents come up and we'll award the... But not only did they, they get these, these knots, uh, they also have these, uh, these medals that they get to wear during um, certain functions and ceremonies that kind of kind of prove that they, they accomplished it. And like I said, this is the very first year that this is offered to the uh, kindergarten and first grade year. Uh, they do it every two years. They will do it again. And, third grade to earn their bear claw. But. Um, along with that, uh, like Jack said, Joyce and Jack spent uh, many Many Tuesdays coming and helping these guys out, and they do have uh, mentor pens or counselor pens that I would like to give them. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without them. So that's it. Thank you.
Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. And uh, for those who uh, weren't here when I preached uh, for you last, a uh, few months back, my name is Reverend Chase Peoples, and I'm a friend of Christa's. Uh, I am a minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, as well as the United Church of Christ denominations. And Krista and I knew each other uh, well, first came to know each other, when we both served downtown churches in St. Joseph, Missouri. Krista was one of the folks in town who welcomed uh, myself and my family uh, heartily as soon as we got there, and we have remained friends uh, throughout the year. And so it's my honor to be back with you again while Krista gets to be away. This morning, I'm going to be sharing from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, in which we see two different stories that relate about Jesus' teachings to his disciples, as well as Jesus' reception in his hometown of Nazareth. Hear these words. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. And the disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. And they said, Where did this man get all this? Who is, what is the wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and John and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power among them, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then... Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing with them except a staff, but no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. I don't know if you've been doing any flying this summer for your travels. Most of my flying these days happens on Southwest. We've got the boarding pass with the letter and the number, and I inevitably forget to you know, check in early and end up in C89 or whatever it is. And you know, you're coming in at that point, bitter and jealous of the families with kids you know, that got to go in early, the service members who got you know, uh, an understandable good seat. And you're stuck, wondering if your uh, carry-on baggage is gonna fit in that overhead bin 
if you're going to end up in that middle seat where both people on either side of you take the armrest and you're stuck in the middle, it's a moment of scarcity where it feels like there's not enough room, not enough space, not enough peanuts, peanuts, not enough little soft drinks in the plastic cup with ice, not enough of everything, and you just aren't sure if you're going to make it. Well, that feeling of scarcity, there is not enough to go around, not enough for me, that if someone else gets theirs, there's not enough for me to get mine, is a mindset that is sold to us from the moment we're born until the moment we die. In a capitalist free market economy, it's how things work. It's how things are used to motivate us, to get our kids through school and into good colleges and on to get good jobs, that if you don't do all these things, then bad things will happen and you will not get the good life and get everything that's promised to you as a good, hardworking American. It's what motivates us in our workplaces that if we don't get the promotion and the raise, someone else will because there's not enough for everyone. It's what motivates us in our neighborhoods or if our neighbor gets something good and we don't follow suit, there is not enough for us and we will miss out. Good grief, it's what made Mark Zuckerberg a quad billionaire trillionaire on social media. That fear of missing out that we are not keeping up with the cleverly curated pictures of our quote unquote friends and their vacations and their lives. It's what we have taught our children and our grandchildren to learn through internet influencers, that you better figure out a way to get yours because there's not enough to go around. And then there's an alternate view. The alternate view taught by scripture from the Garden of Eden to the new city of Jerusalem in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. From the manna provided in the wilderness of Exodus to Jesus feeding the 5,000 in his ministry. A declaration from God that scarcity is not the way God created our world, that God created our world for there to be abundance, enough for all. It's a crazy idea for those of us steeped in our culture, the deep belief that God has created our world where there is enough for everyone and that we are called as God's people to live lives of truly trusting that with God, we will have enough. This promise is not the promise that only good things will happen to us. God does not call us to a faith of magic that says if we know the magic words, then everything is going to work out for us the way we think it should. But to live a life of that deep, abiding trust. That life is more than fighting for an overhead bin in an airplane. United Church of Christ minister Mary Ludy writes this about her experience on airplanes or in crowds, places where a plane might go down or a mass shooter might occur or there could be a stampede that would injure or threaten people. She says, when I'm in that crowd of people and I feel anxious and afraid, 
that there's not enough for us all and I better get mine. She says, I stop and I breathe and I think, if this plane goes down, these might be the people I die with. It's a pretty morbid thought, I think, and not what I want to think about on a plane. But she says, when I think about it that way, I'm able to be compassionate towards the young mother with the crying baby seated right behind me, with the guy taking up too much space and man spreading and uh, spreading over into my seat area, with the man trying to jam five pieces of luggage that should have been checked into the overhead bins. I'm able to be more compassionate and realize if this is it, do I really want to spend my last moments filled with resentment? Or do I want to think about how my life is sacred and their life is sacred and that we're all loved and that our lives don't last that long? And I've tried to take that view. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. But trying to take that breath and trust that, hey, this life of mine isn't that long. And in my struggle to outpace and outwin and outsucceed the people next to me and around me, that I'm missing the point of what this life is about. In this gospel, we have two stories. The first is Jesus shows up in his hometown, preaches and teaches, and the people there, mm -hmm. they knew him, watched him grow up and think, who is he? To stand there and think he has anything to teach us. And they are offended by him. And it says Jesus was astounded at their unbelief. Matthew and Luke tell similar stories and they offer explanations of why Jesus' message went over like a lead balloon. In the Gospel of Luke, the story that Jesus tells is about God offering God's love to the Gentiles. But in Mark, we aren't given an answer about what Jesus taught. But if we tie together this story with the one that comes after it, where Jesus sends out his disciples two by two, I wonder if we might do a little bit of creative imagination when it comes to reading the scripture and wonder if his message to the people of his hometown was similar to what he told his disciples. To go journey out into the world, to fight off the evils that oppress others, to offer healing and wholeness, and to trust that God will take care of you along the way. Don't pack your bags full of everything you think you're going to need, but instead trust that God will provide what you need along the way. I wonder if Jesus preached to his hometown about trusting that God would provide for them, that God would provide for them out of God's abundance if they only dared trust God. That may not seem like such an offensive message. But let me put it to you this way. Preaching to you as a 21st century church at a key moment in your church's life where you're thinking about your future, thinking about what kind of pastor you need for that future, thinking about what church looks like in the 21st century and how different it is from how church looked in the 20th century? 
what if Jesus showed up today and said, let go of all the baggage you've been carrying from how to do church in the 20th century? Because it doesn't work anymore. Just ask your kids and your grandkids who don't attend. And they'll tell you, if they dare to be honest, that the church that meant something to you and to me doesn't mean anything to them. And Jesus said to you and to me, go forward trusting that God is going to provide what you need and don't pack those bags full of stuff that you think you need, that you've used to run church so long. I wonder if that Jesus showed up here or at basically every church I've ever been in and what the reception would be, really, when it came down to making decisions about committees and the building and worship and the church's ministries and its outreach and its Sunday school classes if we really had to trust that we could let go of what we've done and that God would provide what we need. In my experience, sadly, most every church I've been in would say we'd rather die than let go of church as we've done it. Because that feels like failure. That hurts too much to let go of what has meant so much to us so that our children and our grandchildren might have something that means a lot to them. And what I think I've learned is that the church I grew up in, the church I was educated to lead, the churches I'd been in, the church I thought I wanted was a church that didn't trust God very much. Instead, it was a church that said, we're competent people with competent skills. We know what to do. We know how to raise money. We know what it means to get people in the door and people giving money. That we'll run a church a lot like we run our businesses. We'll focus on the customers coming in the door, and we'll focus on the money coming in the budget, and we'll market it like a business, and our profit and our loss will look just like our businesses do. Because we are competent people, and we know what to do. And truth be told, we don't need to trust God very much at all and we aren't expecting God to surprise us or really provide much because we know what needs to be done until we don't anymore. And we discover the church isn't a business and that how God's economics of the kingdom of God are very different than the economics of businesses and their profits and loss sheets. I told a minister friend of mine, what I know now, if I could go back and start all over 25 years ago, I would have said, yes, we need to focus on the budget and fundraising and the building, all that matters, but not near as much as it matters that we learn how to follow Jesus, we learn how to be Christian to one another and how following Jesus really leads us to live a different kind of life with different values than our culture and that we focus on that most of all. Otherwise, we're going to end up with churches that never take a risk, that never truly trust in God, that really don't believe uh, following Jesus results in any different kind of life than any other way. And we're going to end up with a building that 
who struggle to afford an attendance that continues to dwindle and a budget that continues to go down. And when we most need to trust in God, we have no idea how to do it. That message of trusting in God that Jesus might give to us might ask us to do things so differently that we too might amaze Jesus with our unbelief. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he says, I want you to trust that God is going to provide your need. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, once said, nothing offends good, competent people as much as having to trust that God will provide rather than them providing on their own. When Jesus sends them out, he sends them out with very little, trusting that God will provide what they need. Janet uh, Summers, who's a Lutheran minister, writes about this story of sending out of the disciples. And she says, I want to plan for my trips where I've planned every last detail and eventuality out to the end. But when I plan that way, I leave no room for God to surprise me. I want to carry everything I need, but when I am so weighed down by baggage, I have no room to accept the gifts that people on the way wish to give me. When I think I carry my baggage, I have no room to pick up any new blessings that God wants to give me. This is the startling lesson that God wants to give the 21st century church. And it is offensive for those of us who grew up in the 20th century being taught that we can figure it all out on our own. It's amazing that we ever taught that lesson in an organization that was supposed to depend and trust in God. You know, I recently learned that the minister who was behind the movement to print in God we trust upon American currency was a Presbyterian minister. He was the pastor of First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. And he was pastoring in the, the heat of the Cold War and fighting those godless communists. And he preached a gospel that declared that America was a Christian nation and that anyone in America who wasn't a Christian wasn't a true American. And that when he knew that President Eisenhower was going to show up at his church on a Sunday morning, he preached a gospel that said, we need to put in God we trust on our money to show that we are different from the communists. And Eisenhower, wanting to fight the communists and never one to, like any politician, to go against the idea of combining Christianity and patriotism went along with it. But it's an ironic thing. We put it on our money because we certainly don't trust in God. We trust in our money a whole lot more than we trust in God. And in our churches, we feel so much better when we balance the budget, never thinking that the goal of a balanced budget is maybe not what God is calling us to do. After all, God sent out his disciples not carrying a balanced budget at all. The question for the 21st century church is do you trust God enough that God can help you with your grief as you let go of church as you knew it? 
Believe me, I've got plenty of my grief knowing that the church that I know and is meaningful to me means nothing to the teenagers I have at my home. They want no part of it, and it breaks my heart. But truth be told, when I let my heart be broken enough to get over my sadness and grief for what was, and I start asking, well, what is it that they want? I suspect I'm more on the right track of where God is leading me and the church. The question is, do I trust God enough to follow where God is leading rather than looking backwards to where I and God have been? Seems like the same question might be before you as a church. So I'll leave you with this story. Thomas Freedom, the New York Times columnist, once told a story about why the peace process in the Middle East never really gets anywhere. He said, once there was a faithful and righteous man named Goldberg, and Goldberg prayed each week, dear God, let me win the lottery, because I deserve it. And each week he would come back and say, God, you didn't let me win the lottery last week. Why won't you let me win the lottery? I'm a good and righteous and loyal person. I deserve to win the lottery. Each week he would harangue God for not letting him win the lottery until finally one week God spoke from heaven and said, Goldberg, give me a chance. Buy a ticket, why don't you? I tend to think that those of us raised in the 20th century church, we prayed and we sang and we heard sermons and read stories from the Bible and we taught our children messages about trusting God and having faith, and then we never really had to practice it. And then we find ourselves, when we need it most, not having any experience trusting God. And so we pray, God, why won't you bring our children and our grandchildren to church? Why can't things be like they used to? God, help us, help our church. And I feel like God is up in, heading, up in heaven going, buy a ticket, why don't you? Give it a shot. Maybe if you actually took a chance and you trusted that I know what I'm doing and I'm going to provide out of the abundance I've already laid out in the world, who knows what might be possible? But you say in God we trust. Why don't you try it out for once? Amen.
we take up an offering each week in worship, uh, even though there are a lot more convenient ways to give money to the church in its mission than passing the plate these days. But we do it as a part of our worship to practice the whole trusting in God thing. <laughs> trusting that if we take our eyes and our hearts off of buying and accumulating more stuff that we really don't need, and turn our eyes and hearts towards giving generously to people who need us to give and offer blessings so they too might know the abundance of God. That's why we take up an offering. So may we give with generous hearts and minds and use this exercise as practice of what it means to trust in God. so that we might be generous people, full of glad hearts, trusting in your abundance, turning ourselves away from the stuff that really doesn't matter, towards the things that matter most in this life. Use what we give to spread your faith, your hope, and your love. Amen. We transition now from a time of worship to a time of prayer. We offer prayers of people, places, things, whatever is on our hearts. After each one, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond by saying, here are our prayers. What do we have to offer God this morning? Yes, Linda. I'd like to offer prayers 
for our son Andrew and our grand, oldest grandson Blake. They're on a 12-day mission trip with their church in Pennsylvania to Latvia, and they're teaching English in a day camp. They're staying at a 200, 300-year-old church, and they're teaching it through games and sports. Something different. In your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer of Thanksgiving. Katie had her son, Adrian, on um, uh, Wednesday. He's seven pounds five inch, uh, five, seven pounds five ounces, and twenty-one inches long. And both Katie and the baby are home and doing well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, Marcus. I wanted to say a prayer of Thanksgiving for uh, Rebecca who got back to Ghana safe and sound and had the uh, naming ceremony with her community and really lived into the connections of the baptism and the life of the child and the future of the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other prayers. I would offer a prayer for our good friend Paul Wickens and Hope that his health care team will continue to figure out what they can do to heal him. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. for our prayer. Any other prayers? Yes. Um, just to remember Susan Heim Davis as she continues with her attempts to rehab. For Susan Heim Davis, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Any others? They were gathered in a certain spot. And the disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. As we come to our time of celebrating the Lord's Supper, sharing Holy Communion with one another and with God, it's yet another practice of worship where we get to enact and embody the truth of trusting God and God's abundance that there is enough for everyone. That God's table is not just for those of us who get there first. God's table is just not there for those of us of a certain race or economic class. That God's table is there and available not just to heterosexual people only, the God's table is open to everybody, no matter who they're voting for in November. The God's table has room enough around it, even for mine and your enemies. That there's space at God's table, even for the people who deep down in my heart and my secret prejudices or resentments, I'd rather not be there. We get to experience the truth and the blessing that God loves each and every one of us, that each and every one of us is a person of worth, that at God's table there is room for all, and we declare it and live it out, trusting that we aren't supposed to just live that truth on Sunday morning, but live it all through our lives that God makes space for every one of us, even the times we'd rather God left out a few. Because the truth is, if God's grace extends to those whom we don't want to give it to, then that means God's grace extends to us, even if other people don't want us to have it. It's how we learn to live together and love together as people of God, trusting that at God's table, 
There is room for all of us. And so we remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his followers around a table and he took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. And then he took a cup and he shared it and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. I'm broken. I'm glad people who know what they're doing are in charge.
And now as we end this time of worship together and go out from this place, hear these words. May the strength of Christ go before you to prepare your way. May the grace of Christ come behind you to finish what you must leave undone. May the peace of Christ surround you in this exact moment. And may the love of Christ guide your every word, your every thought, your every deed. Amen.